This is the Venturing Angler Podcast. I'm Tim Harden. In this episode, we'll be chatting with Chris King from The Fly Shop about fly fishing for trout in Northern California. Let's chat with Chris. All right, we're here with Chris King from the Fly Shop in Redding, California, and we're going to be talking about fly fishing for uh, trout in the rivers in Northern California. Welcome to the Venturing Angler Podcast, Chris. Ah, good morning. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And so you're in you're in sort of the epicenter for great trout fishing in in a sizable state, uh, and so um, I'm excited to hear about the offerings up there. I've, I've you know to be honest, I've, I've fished up there a lot, but haven't. I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface. And I remember when I first started fishing in Northern California, um, I thought that a bunch of rivers that were up there were up there, and they're not. Like the Lower Owens, I thought, was up there. Uh, and then I c- came to learn that there's a lot of well-known rivers um, that uh, you know are, are, are right around there. And so I was impressed with the abundance of riches that are up there. And so um, I'm excited to break this down and pro- probably make things a lot easier for people who are thinking about taking a trip there. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm in Redding, uh, California, and so we're at the top of the valley. And so we're like in a little box canyon up here. We've got mountains on three sides of us, you know, um, Sacramento River Valley to the south of us. And within a two-hour radius of Redding, there's more water than you could fish in a lifetime, honestly. Um, you know, I, I cut my teeth, uh, guiding and, uh, really getting into this. My dad was a a fly fisherman, so I kind of grew up around it, but I didn't really pick it up until the summers when I was uh, spending time in Breckenridge, Colorado. I spent about eight years there and, you know, just so much water in the Rockies. And when I came out here, I actually moved out here as a sales rep for House of Hardy Reels. Um, and I moved to, uh, California and, uh, eventually migrated up North here and I was blown away at the amount of water that was up here and the fact that, you know, it's a year round fishery. So there is water 365 days a year that fishes very well for trout any day. Um, and so many of, you know, the other famous, uh, trout areas, you know, have a three, four, maybe five month season. Um, so it's really a special place here in Northern California that, you know, for a fly angler, um, and if you add steelhead onto that as well, of course, the the options are endless up here. So it's really a, a mecca for that. And I can understand why, you know, a place like the fly shop where I work now, you know, the largest fly fishing out, uh, uh, outfitter in the, in the world, um, and retailer in the world is, uh, based here in Reading because there's just so much to do with a fly rod in this, uh, in this region. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience where I grew up fishing, um, and then when I got to Colorado, I started fly fishing and, um, you know, fished the blue and the frying pan and the South Platte. And, you know, the South Platte's very different than the blue, and the, and the frying pan's got that basalt rock. But generally, the rivers are are pretty similar. The Colorado's bigger, but, um, you know, the Roaring Fork's bigger. But I am always impressed with the diversity of the fisheries in, in your area, too. Um every river is very different from the other, it seems. And so I'd love to break some of these down and it, it we should probably start with the one closest to, uh, to where you are now, um, the lower sack. Um, how would you characterize this river? It's such a go-to for, for so many people and so well known. Yeah. The lower sack is a trout factory. Um, you know, that's the best way to, that's the best way to put it. Uh, there's, there's year round food. Um, when we talk about, you know, the Chinook salmon uh, that come up here and spawn that are, you know, swimming under the Golden Gate Bridge and all the way up the valley before they, they get here and, and make that long journey. Uh, it's the only river in the world that has four distinctly different runs of Chinook salmon. Um, and that's a pretty special thing. So you've got all this abundance of protein for the trout um, and food year round, not to mention, you know, the aquatic insects uh, that are there and the, just the sheer size of the river. So, you know, right now when the river's running at like 3,800 CFS, it's pretty low. Uh, we need some uh, water, but if you think about that, 3,800 CFS, usually, you know, 5,000 in the fall when they shut the irrigation off, um, 5,000 CFS would blow out any river in the Rockies. Uh, absolutely just a, a massive amount of water. 
where our river, you know, when the flows are up for irrigation in the summertime, it's actually the opposite of most of your other, you know, trout fisheries where they run big, uh, you know, during the rains in the winter and the spring, and then they run lower in the summer. Ours is the opposite of that because, you know, it's California. So everything is about water and, and getting stuff down to the farms. Um, but, you know, it'll run 12,000, 15,000 uh, in the summer months. That's, an, that's a massive amount of water and a massive amount of, you know, food source and, and you know, oxygenated water coming down from the dam. And the thing that really makes it special is Shasta Dam itself. Um, there's actually a temperature curtain on the backside of the dam. Back in the early 90s, uh, during the drought years, um, there was a real problem with uh, the water getting too warm. And, uh, you know, they lost a lot of habitat and a lot of the eggs from the salmon uh, didn't make it uh, through a couple of cycles of spawn. And so they placed this uh, temperature curtain on the backside of the dam. And basically what it does is it pulls water from different levels of the lake, uh, depending on what the temperature is downstream. So there's a thermometer in Redding. Uh, there's one in uh, Cottonwood and there's one in Red Bluff. And they monitor the temperature of the river. And that activates where they pull the water from in the lake. So uh, I don't know, you know, for, for those who don't know, when you talk about lake fishing, you talk to the, you know, super, uh, you know, into it bass guys, they talk about lakes flipping uh, different seasons. So the warm water uh, goes to the bottom and the bass, you know, in the wintertime are all, you know, pretty low. And then, you know, come spring, the lake flips again and the warm water comes to the top and the cold water goes to the bottom. And then that's when you find the bass moving up to, spawn in the shallows because they like that warmer water so anytime you have just a regular bottom release tailwater which you know you mentioned the blue river like so so many rivers uh throughout the rockies of frying pan all of them are, are tailwaters and bottom release dams so the river is affected by that lake flipping every season uh so when it when that water moves up and down the water temperature in those rivers uh fluctuate based on that <laughs> Excuse me. Well, with with our river, um, it's a constant temperature because there's four different runs of salmon. So every time, every you know season of the year when there's salmon up here spawning, they need to maintain that optimum you know spawning temperature, which is below 56 degrees. And so in the town of Reading itself, maybe three and a half, four miles down from the dam, uh, the temperature is 51 degrees every day of the year. And so not only is that a great temperature for spawning salmon, but it's an incredible temperature for rainbow trout. So, And this is, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, this is all regulated under the Endangered Species Act now because of the, the crisis that came from, from the droughts. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So those, uh, a few of those runs, especially uh, this, the winter run of salmon um, are, uh, listed threatened so there's even a section of the river now that started uh, i think four years ago um that's actually closed uh from you know the end of april to the first part of august uh they close an entire section of the river while those salmon are spawning which you know you can argue either way you know that the the question was, you know, eventually they had to do something and, you know, they talked about it closing the river down completely uh, to fishing, but instead they closed like the uppermost stretches where those salmon seem to spawn more. But um, I don't know. There's there's some different thought process about that. Myself, I don't understand closing trout fishing to protect salmon. It's like closing deer season to protect elk. But um, we do, we deal with it and we lose the top, uh, you know, four miles of uh, fishing during that time of year. But that's where, you know, for us anyway, on the lower sack, that's where our bigger uh, fish are at. So in town, our rainbows are, you know, averaging 16 inches where uh, south of us, maybe five miles down through Anderson, uh, the, that um, average size goes down to like 14, 13 uh, inches. But we also have steelhead down through there in the lower river um, that come up in the fall and the winter months, which uh, can make things exciting when you're fishing a six weight for, you know, a 13 inch trout all day. And all of a sudden you whale on a, you know, Central Valley 24 inch steelhead and he jumps eight times and gets off and your client looks like, what did I do wrong? And you say everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, <No. laughs> well, the, the lower sack going to be one of the hardest uh, rivers for me to guide the conversation with because there's so much going on there. Um, so 
one of the things I like to ask about uh, when it comes to destinations is the seasons. Um, but I'm sure that that's going to be a little challenging to unpack because there's you know, s- several species, several runs, and uh, um, just a lot of temperature variance too uh, on that river. Um, some some pretty big extremes, not in the water, but um, you know, it, I've floated that river when it's 110 degrees. And so, uh, what what can you offer us when it comes to fishing there with respect to seasons? So the biggest thing that uh, I got when I first moved here is to take it in chunks. You take it in pieces. Um, you know, coming from uh, the Breckenridge area of Colorado, fishing rivers like the Blue, the South Platte, um, they're so so small in comparison. Um, and so you come out here and you're looking at a stretch of river that's you know 150 yards wide. Uh, wh- where do I start? And so, you know, break it off into sections, break it off into, okay, this first, you know, 15 yard wide stretch next to the bank, how would I approach that? Like, I'm not even going to look at the middle of the river. I'm just going to look at this edge. Is it moving? Is, is there current? Is it a back eddy? Right. Um, And so you kind of piece it off that way. And, you know, what we've found over the years and, you know, especially right now, uh, most of those fish are hanging off the drop off. So it's actually, with the exception of when it's real low, like right now, you know, um, it's actually very difficult to fish on foot. Uh, and you don't want to be out there on foot and try to come out and wade. You know, when I give little presentations to the local fly clubs, I tell the guys, you know, uh, 8,000 CFS is your mark. So anything over 8,000 CFS, um, you, you don't want to come up to Reading and try to, you know, wade the edges of this river. The, you're walking down the bank and all of a sudden the bank's gone. Um, and, you know, some of the areas it's, you know, six, eight feet deep right next to the bank. Uh, other areas are, there's some good riffles. Um, but usually when the water's lower like this, you can access some of those riffles. The river itself is best access from a boat. There's some center cut runs and gravel bars uh, that you can, you know, get out and, and do some fishing on. But even there, it's not going to be, where you can pick it apart with a, you know, indicator rod or a, uh, you know, Euro nymph rod or, or something like that. Um, it it kind of picks and chooses. So if we start, you know, let's start in the spring. In the springtime, um, you know, we have kind of two sets or two, you know, genes um, for our trout. And some of them will spawn in the winter months up in the creeks and some of them will spawn actually in the river. So, you know, we've made a big push over the years, you know, I, I, like in the late 90s when I moved out here, uh, you know, we were all still uh, targeting, you know, fish on reds um, even then. And, and that's just something that everyone did. That's why we have glow bugs and egg patterns. And we, you know, threw them in Colorado before I moved out here. Uh, you know, it's just kind of the mindset has changed. So now we really concentrate on trying to stay away from those areas, trying to keep our feet out of those areas because we realize how important it is to let those you know, fish spawn and, and bring us the next generation of fish. So um, the springtime is kind of a mixed bag. You'll get, uh, you know, some fish that are uh, colored up and hook jawed and um, down below the reds that way. And then you'll have others that are, you know, crystal clear and bright um, that, uh, you know, were, were creek spawners in the winter months. So, you know, even during that time when, let's say, we're not concentrating on catching half of the fish that are in the river, uh, there's still plenty of rainbows around um, that uh, are not in that spawn mode that you can access in the riffles and, and the deep runs. The majority of the fishing that we do is off the drop off. Um, I'll tell guys when they come up and, hey, you know, we haven't fished this river much. Uh, what should we do? We brought a drift boat with us. Uh, you know, it's like, how do you how do you break down a river that's running at 12,000 CFS? Um, and I'll tell them just, you know, slide out in the run. Uh, those long runs, some of them are, like I said, you know, if they're 200 yards wide, they're 800 yards long before it tails out and goes into the next riffle and run. Um, you know, slide out till you can see bottom on one side and you can't see it on the other. And fish to the side, you can't see the bottom one. So it's like that's kind of where those fish uh, concentrate for us. That's the best advice I can give to somebody, you know, coming out uh, to the lower sack and giving it a go, having not seen it. And then, of course, you know, eventually you come up a few times, you get your spots. I like this nook. I like that cranny um, and, and whatnot. But that's kind of the way it is uh, here is that they're, they're really out deep. So as the water gets up above that, you know, 8,000 CFS mark, um, you really just can't get to them on foot. 
uh, to where they hold because they're out off the deep drop offs. This is sweet because I got my ass handed to me the last two times I floated the lower sack. So I'm, <laughs> I'm already benefiting from this. And I'm sure other people are taking notes like I am too. Um, one of the one of the things that's that's mo- I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the waiting um, because it's it's really a river for floating a lot of the time. Um, it's also like unquestionably. I mean, there's certainly other species to target, but this is a river for rainbows. Um, what makes this such an exceptional river for rainbow trout? Well, like I said, I think it, I think it has to do with all the food. Like I mean, the the aquatic life in the river is unsurpassed. Um, you know, with the the weed beds there. I mean, there's so many caddis, and there's so we, we uh, let's just I mean, I, and I've seen it change quite a bit um, since I've been here. Uh, when, when I first moved here in the late '90s, we still had a lot of warmer water bugs. Um, and that, that insect life has changed in the, you know, 20 something years that I've been here. Um, and it, it's, there are a lot more, uh, mayflies around a lot more betas, PMDs, uh, colder water bugs where it was all caddis in the late nineties. You know, uh, I can remember going out and, you know, you'd si- t- tie on a size 12 fox pupa and a size 10 bird's nest. That's all you needed to know. And just throw it in the riffles and, you know, catch trout all day long. And those big hydrocyc and uh, brachycentric caddis have kind of uh, diminished over the years and have been taken over by the betas and the PMDs uh, uh, that we see now. So, you know, now you're going out and we're throwing a lot of, you know, little tactical style mayflies, a lot of jig flies uh, now um, because they're just so popular in, in the industry right now. But they think they get down uh, slender bodies. Um, and it's a lot different. Your average hook size now is, you know, 16, 18, where, you know, trying to catch the lower sack trout that, you know, remember, average 16 inches, they're full of pro- protein, they're complete, you know, muscular fish. If you've ever seen pictures of lower sack trout, they're not, you know, your big belly, you know, and you pick them up with one hand, your hand doesn't go into the fish, the fish stays solid. Um, and so it's, it's, it's definitely a, a, a challenge. And that's what makes it so fun. But there's just so much food and there's so much opportunity that you have, you know, so many chances during the day, um, you know, probably average uh, landing rate is like 50%. You know, if you think about that, you know, <laughs> um, it's pretty, pretty insane fish. Uh, yeah. They're, you know, like I said, it's a, it's a giant trout factory. And I, and I attest that to, you know, all the food source, uh, you know, the, the four different runs of salmon that are creating uh, eggs and that pure protein where you have, you know, the famous uh, trout fisheries up in Alaska and in the Rockies uh, and, and through those areas. Um, and they have a much shorter growth cycle where our fish have a year round growth cycle. So they can, you know, pack on protein, pack on pounds um, all year long. Uh, and, and I think that's really what what makes the difference. And part of that um, goes all the way back to that temperature curtain because it's a consistent temperature year round uh, in this river. So that's got to be pretty cool to have watched the evolution of a river, not only with rebounding with fish, but also seeing the bug life change so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it makes for uh, interesting, you know, topics and, you know, guide conversations where I remember this and I remember that. And yeah, my beard's gray now, but I feel like it was just yesterday that, you know, you could go out and uh, uh, count on this hash to happen at that time. And um, the things just kind of change and, you know, uh, morph through the years uh, to, you know, and different, but it's, it's really fun and cool to see, um, a fishery uh, be as resilient as I've seen uh, the lower sack be over the years, you know, where it's still, and, and the traffic let's, I mean, when we talk about traffic now, it's probably the most popular, uh, at least one of the most popular rivers in California and the amount of boats and river traffic now versus, you know, when I first showed up in the late nineties is, is ridiculous. It's, it's unheard of, you know, um, there was probably, Oh, well, six of us guiding here at the fly shop uh, when I started, and now there's 20, wow. uh, and, and there's probably another 40 um, full-time, you know, guides uh, that are here uh, that don't work for the shop that, that work this area. So, you know, any given day in October on one of the boat ramps uh, up on the upper stretch of 
of the river where the fish are big and the salmon like to spawn. I mean, there'll be 34 boats trying to put in in the morning. So it's, it's, it's far different than it was, you know, that I've, than I've seen it over the years for sure. Um, and to still have that consistent uh, action, even with that much traffic, uh, it just, you know, uh, speaks uh, volumes to what this fishery has to offer and how, you know, how prolific it really is. It's a pretty big river. I remember the first time I put in in a drift boat. Um, I looked down for a second and looked up. I'd gone about 100 yards, it seemed. And so with respect to gear, especially rods, um, what do you recommend folks bring up? Yeah, nine, nine and a half foot six weight. That's that's not like your mark. You know, you, you can do it with a nine footer, uh, but uh, you, I mean, with, with the nymphing tactics that we use here and the big uh, long leaders, as you can imagine, when the flows are that big and you're fishing those drop offs, you know, sometimes we're fishing, you know, uh, eight, nine feet between, you know, the indicator and the split shot. So, you know, to be able to uh, get that fish up and uh, bring it to the net uh, next to the boat, uh, the extra length helps you. So a lot of guys fish nine and a half footers, some fish 10 footers. Um, five weight is really too light uh for the, the pull of the fish and the volume of water so you know you you can certainly you know uh tone down a, a big fish with a, a light rod i mean that's one of the things that's so much fun about fly fishing is you know using smaller uh, lighter gear uh and and feeling those fish move but when you add the volume of water that we have on the lower sack you're really um, kind of hindering uh, the trout's uh, recovery uh, by fighting them uh, so long. So we really recommend, uh, you know, minimum six weight. Uh, a lot of guys will fish sevens uh, as well for these trout. The, the next river that I have on my mind um, is the McLeod. It's such a special river, and one of the coolest experiences I've had is being in um, in Patagonia in Argentina and catching a trout knowing that it had come from that strain uh, from from that river. Um, so let's let's look at the let's look at the McLeod a little bit. The McLeod River is definitely um, close to anyone's heart that has spent any time up here in Northern California. It's one of those rivers you have to go see. Um, it's one of those rivers that is like a fairy tale when you first get down into it. Um, and you know, that is proven by the fish themselves, like you said, you know, from the original Campbell Creek hatchery, which is now, uh, you know, under the lake, um, those fish were put all over the world. So the first rainbows that were, you know, um, transported, uh, to the Rockies, to Patagonia, all, all over the world, um, you can kind of dial that strain down and follow it all the way back to the McLeod river, uh, and the McLeod river red band. So I mean, that that in itself is something to be said. Um, the, the folks, uh, you know, back then um, saw how special those fish were, how willing they were to uh, rise to a fly, how well they fought and how many times they jumped and danced. Uh, now, to this day, um, <coughs> sorry, bless you. So to this day, um, there are so many. Uh, you know, stocking efforts over the years and uh, whatnot that the actual strain of the McLeod River Red Band is actually no longer found in the McLeod River. There's a few tribute. There's a few tributary creeks uh, up on the upper stretch above the McLeod Reservoir that still have that Red Band in it. So, you know, um, if you know anything about uh, you know California heritage trout, there's a you know, a uh, little patch you can get from a uh, fishing game where if you go and catch all the heritage trout. Um, and so we have a lot of uh, people asking where they can go find those. And, and the pure strain is no longer in the McLeod. But the trickle down effect is that a lot of those traits are still there. They're still willing to, you know, rise well to a fly. They still dance and give you lots of jumps uh, when you're fighting them. Uh, the McLeod River is, you know, full of uh, elephant ears and it's in a deep canyon. So even in the middle of August, it's lush and green and beautiful. And the, the river itself has this kind of blue green, uh, you know, hue to it uh, from the silt coming out of Mud Creek where uh, it drains, you know, the um, glacier that's up on the backside of Mount Shasta. Uh, it's been sought after for years. Um, you know, the Hearst uh, family, the big newspaper folks, uh, have a large property above McLeod Reservoir. Uh, below the reservoir itself, um, you know, you've had uh, some clubs down there that have owned pieces of this 
uh, for generations, like the Hills Brothers, uh, which is now the Polly Fox Club that we manage here at the Fly Shop. Uh, the Fishers own a large uh, portion of it. Um, the Fishers property used to be called the Millionaires Club, and the Millionaires uh, Club sold uh, a portion of it to the Nature Conservancy. And so there's a spot that's run by the Nature Conservancy where it's about a three and a half or so mile uh, stretch, and half of it is open to the public uh, to the tune of 10 uh, fishing rods a day only. And the other half is closed to fishing, hasn't been fished uh, in years and years and years, and it's just uh, protected and, and beautiful. And it's one of those... <laughs> One of those few rivers um, where you're seeing the respect given to it that it needs, um, where uh, folks, whether they be uh, public entities or private, um, are really trying to protect it and keep it as pristine as possible uh, over the years. It's a, it's a wonderful place. It's probably my, my favorite trout fishing uh, river in the area for sure. Yeah, me too. You mentioned Hills Brothers. Is that the coffee company? They were, yeah. And that's the one that's that's part of the joke and the river runs through it. That's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> a can full of worms, right? Um, yeah, that's right. All right. Red one, <laughs> brothers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where, um, you know, what comes next? Uh, what, what, what river pops up next in your mind when you're thinking about uh, this region of California? Uh, well, I'm a freestone guy. So, you know, uh, before we move on to the, you know, uh, other famous uh, stuff that we have up here, like the little spring creeks, you can't overlook the upper sack. The upper sack as well has, you know, had its storied history. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, Euro nymphing uh, that has become so, so popular uh, now, um, I would argue that it got its roots uh, there on the upper sack with uh, guys like Ted Fay uh, that, uh, you know, learned from uh, excuse me, from the Wintu Indians, uh, how they went about uh, catching trout on on the river. And it was a high-sticking method. He used to uh, tie this fly called a bomber, and it was, you know, wrapped with all kinds of lead. And he'd cast it upstream and just kind of follow it down with the flow of the river as it was uh, coming down. And that morphed into, well, you know, I can uh, detect the take a little better if I have an indicator on it, uh, but I'm still keeping all my fly line off the water. And you know, that was an incredible fishery right up until uh, 91 when, you know, I don't know if you know, but there was an infamous um, spill up there, chemical spill. Uh, and uh, it was a pesticide called metamsodium that, you know, 19,000 gallons of it came off of a, a railroad, uh, you know, spill, big train trestle that uh, there's a place called Cantera Loop where you know, it almost, the, the train itself does a, like a 180 on this uh, stretch of, of track. And the train that time was so long um, that it pulled itself off the track and spilled into the river. And so you had 36 miles of river that was completely dead, killed every living thing, every plant, every invertebrate, every crayfish, every sculpin, every trout, um, absolutely all the way down to the lake. And it was devastating. Uh, that was before I came here, obviously. Uh, that was back in the early 90s that that happened in 91. Um, and by the time I had gotten here uh, the, in the late 90s, the river had completely recovered. And it's interesting to see, once again, how resilient a watershed can be when you take the main stem um, and completely uh, sterilize it, basically, and it becomes repopulated by its tributaries from insect life to, uh, you know, uh, your, your crayfish, your sculpin, your rainbows, um, all of that. So from Cantera up, uh, it fishes quite differently than it does from Cantera down. And it's really interesting to see the difference because from Cantera up, it's gone unchanged. Um, but from Cantera down, it's, it's been born uh, renewed. Um, you have the lower stretches of the upper sack uh, down closer to Lake Shasta, where you get some uh, rainbows that run up from the lake. You'll even get some, you know, uh, spotted bass that'll be in the lower end of the river down there as well. That'll take streamers pretty well. But you'll have lake run rainbows uh, down there. And, uh, you know, they're crystal bright and they look like little mini steelhead, but even though they're not. Um, where up in Cantera, the rainbows up there, you know, have your traditional, uh, you know, red hues to the side and, and the beautiful colors that rainbows are known for. Um, and it's just a wonderful 
fishery on the upper sack because it's the place where you know over the years um i've always said well how, how do you want to go fishing today because you can choose the way you want to fish and go to the upper sack if you want a euro nymph if you want to throw a dry all day if you want to throw dry droppers if you want to you know a traditional nymph with an indicator or swing flies with a trout spay that opportunity is there for you on the upper sack and the other thing that makes the upper sack um so special is the access, uh, you know, because of that railroad that follows the entire uh, length of it. Um, the railroad company allows the anglers access. So you have, you know, 36 miles of access uh, all the way up and down the river. Um, any given off ramp as you're driving up I-5, you can pull off, find your way to the railroad tracks and walk the river. So it's really that particular part of it, I think, is the coolest thing about the Upper Sack is that how much accessible public water um, that there actually is there. And that's, you know, pretty accessible, as you mentioned, and also, uh, you know, more suitable to, to uh, wading. How far is that from Redding? Mm, to get over the lake, it's about 30 minutes to the bottom end of the river, and it's about an hour to Dunsmuir, okay. where, uh, where Lake Shastina is, where it comes out. And you mentioned trout spay rods and, and euro nymph rods. Uh, otherwise, nine foot five weights pretty good for that river. Yeah, pretty general trout stuff. Yeah, nine five is about about perfect. You can do a little bit of both with that. And change tactics during the day if you want to. But uh, I'm a big fan of swinging sculpins and little softies on a eleven foot three weight. There's uh, no better place in the world, I think, than uh, the upper sack to do that, because especially on the lower end, it gets a little bigger and wider, and it's uh, uh, available uh, for that. And there's it's just a really fun way to fish. As you get up from Cantera Loop up, uh, you know, it gets a little more canyony. Um, all the way up to Nay Springs, there's uh, you know a little tighter watershed up there, so you know a little smaller rod, high stick in efforts, uh, and whatnot. So. Frequent listeners to this podcast know that I try to avoid any shameless plugs until the end, but I did see yesterday, I mean, I've, I've trout, I've fished with a trout spay rod a good amount, but I wouldn't mind getting better. Um, I saw yesterday that you were offering trout spay classes on the upper sack, correct? Uh, yeah, we're actually going to do that one on the lower sack just because it's such a bigger environment. Um, but, uh, several of our guides, uh, here at the fly shop, uh, love to do trout spay and, uh, do, uh, trout spay days. Um, and we are doing, uh, some clinics in the spring, uh, that I'll teach on the lower sack, just about fundamentals and techniques and dealing with the smaller, uh, two-handed rod. Um, cause it's a little lighter, a little more delicate than, you know, your 13 and a half foot seven weight. Uh, it's just a little different animal. The lines are different. Um, and we're going to do a pretty cool clinic, uh, just on discussing, you know, all the ins and outs of the difference between trout spay and, and, you know, regular spay. So. All right. After the upper sack, where are you looking next? Uh, as far as, um, rivers you'd, you'd mention as, as central to the Northern part of the state. Uh, well, I mean, if we look uh, out to the east of Reading, you've got uh, the Pitt River, you've got Hack Creek, you've got Fall, Fall River. Um, you know, the Pitt is uh, a really cool watershed, too. It's um, it's notorious for being very difficult to wade, and it is. There are, you know, grease bowling balls, some of which are actually the size of Volkswagens. Um, so it is a difficult river to access. Uh, it is a foot access river. There's a series of like seven different dams down through there uh, with PG and E. And so there's all these little tailwaters that uh, that fish differently. Um, and it can be a really exciting river, but it's not for the faint of heart. Um, so we don't have a lot of traffic there. If you're looking to, you know, go fall in a couple of times, maybe break a rod, get wet and get away from everybody else, the pit's your game. Uh, the fish there are phenomenal, um, very strong, uh, great high sticking river, um, but really difficult to get around in. You know, even uh, when I moved here, I was still in my 20s uh, and I would still wear uh, felt spikes and carry a staff when I was on the pit. Uh, guiding it in my young days uh, in early spring when it's still cold in the morning and you're, you know, preparing to wet wade and your clients are putting their waders on looking at you like you're crazy. Like, what are you doing? Are you wet wade today? And you look at them in the eyes, dead in the eyes, and you tell them, well, at the end of the day, I'm the only one that's going to be dry. So <laughs> the, <laughs> <You> just... <laughs> I've, and it's a funny thing is I've always heard the pit described this way, like, hey, it's one of the greatest things you'll ever see, but let us warn you. And, um, you're, you're going to get wet. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to fall in. <laughs> and, and this is a river that 
has, you know, I mentioned early on that each river that I think we're going to be talking about is very different from the other. This one is really lush and it's, it's spectacularly beautiful. Not that the others aren't, but it is in a different way. On the pit? Yeah. Yeah, it can be. Uh, the, the, I think the neatest thing about the pit is uh, the areas where the fish hold. They hold the majority uh, of the time in uh, the pocket water, in the super fast water. So if you like scrambling over and, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a Euro uh, nymphers dream. Uh, on on the pit river because if you like you know scrambling up like a kid and crawling over that rock and peeking over the other side and just you know kind of flipping it into the fast water and uh, catching a fish that is you know super strong from hanging out in in such fast current uh, that's going to really give you a tussle on that you know 10 foot three weight I mean that's definitely your game right there um, there are, you know, other times of the year now that it's open year round, uh, where those fish will drop back into the longer, uh, slower runs. Um, but traditionally when it was, you know, last Saturday in April to November 15th, uh, those fish are always sucked up in the high water. Well, you mentioned, you know, how hot it can get up here and the ambient temperature, uh, in the air can, you know, definitely get into the hundreds, uh, uh, every single summer. And so what you see on rivers like the McLeod, the Upper Sack, the Pit, is through the summer months, those fish really move up into the oxygen. So you're always going to find them up in that fast water. Um, and if you're not uh, snagging up on bottom, whether you're fishing an indicator or not, um, you're not fishing deep enough or heavy enough uh, to, to, you know, tactically get after where those fish are at. So that's another little gem for you as you're exploring, you know, through the uh, warm water, uh, warm air months uh, up here. You just got to make sure that you're fishing super fast water to the heads of the riffles uh, in and around the pockets. And that's that's where those rainbows uh, really like to hide uh, for us. But if you're a flat water guy and you like to fish those long runs and, you know, like to see fish rise every day that you go fishing, then our two spring creeks out to the east, uh, Hack Creek and Fall River, um, and that's that's really where you want to be concentrating, uh, you know, your time. So, And those those two I've never been to. Um, so, you know, Hack Creek, actually both of them are pretty well known. Um, how would you uh, – how, how far are each from Redding and how would you describe – each river um they're pretty close to one another they're about uh maybe 20 30 minutes apart um and they're about an hour and a half uh to the east from redding uh hack creek uh would be uh, a foot traffic river uh, all waiting uh fall river is boat only and they fish from prams uh with you know either a little trolling motor or um a small outboard uh, to get where you need to go and then uh, a little trolling motor to position the boat Fall River is pretty, pretty neat. It's, you know, they fish from the prams, uh, they anchor them sideways. So usually um, the prams have uh, two sets of anchors. And so you'll, you'll anchor sideways in the current and fish downstream uh, towards the fish. And it is absolutely crystal clear. It is absolutely flat as a pancake. Uh, and if you're not fishing a 15 foot leader down to at least six X, I'm usually fishing seven, uh, you're not doing it right. Um, you can go up there and you can, you know, uh, I gotta be real careful here. You can go up there and you can, uh, bastardize, uh, what fall river is and chuck indicators over the side of a boat and go back up to the top of the run and go down. But that river is way too special to treat it that way. In my opinion, um, it is the river where, uh, you know, our crippled flies, uh, came from. Think about every time you've tied on, uh, a, a, a cripple, uh, a fly pattern, one that, you know, represents that insect that is half in the water and half out and learning the difference on how trout rise, whether they're eating a merger is just under the surface or that insect is, you know, starting to crawl out of its shuck and, and they're they're eating uh, those, or whether they're actually eating completely on the surface. It's uh, where guys like Bob Quigley uh, developed his skills, and and you know that eventually you know moved over uh, to the Henry's Fork, where they were uh, taking all these patterns that Bob had developed on on Fall River back in the day. It it is the quintessential piece of fly fishing um, for me uh, that we have right there where you can go learn um, and see why fly fishing itself developed. It, and it developed so that we can take something that is light as a feather 
and uh, put it to a wary trout that is, you know, 30, 40 feet away from us uh, and land it, you know, like like it you fell out of the sky from God's hand itself. And when the, when the fish eats it, you know, just bury that hook and, and get them. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a different game. And it's one of the few places um, that I know here in California through the entire state where, you know, you can, uh, you know, go do that and see that and really be you against the fish. Is it a numbers game up there? No. Should it be? I don't think it should. Can it be? Of course. And, you know, when you have good hatches or good weed bed lines, um, you know, you can get in there and, and rail on them. But uh, I think, you know, jumping around the upper sack and high sticking and doing that is kind of more suited towards, you know, that numbers mindset than than fall is. I think fall is one of those special places where it's still closed during the winter and there's still a trout season. And from the last Saturday in April to November 15th, every day of the season, there's fish rising on that river. Um, and uh, I'd like to see it stay that way. And, you know, the more traffic and the more um, we've seen, um, you know, traffic and nymphing tactics and things like that on a fishery, the less likely those fish are to rise as, you know, years go by. So um, I think Fall River is a really cool, special place um, that you can hang out in the boat with a, a good friend or your pops and uh, throw dry flies and, um, you know, just see a really neat part of the country. Yeah, it's important to keep rivers that way. Um, I, I think I shared this on a, on a recent podcast, but I didn't know what the Henry's Fork was a long time ago when I went there for the first time, and I didn't see any fish rising, so I threw on a couple nymphs and fished for an hour, and then I got to the parking lot and got a little bit of a lecture. Um, but ever since then, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> from someone from California, by the way. Um, <laughs> and so ever since then, I've realized what the Henry's Fork is and what it needs to be, and it's... You know, for now for me, if I were to see someone nymphing, I'd you know have a friendly conversation um, afterwards, just to just to keep it keep that purity. And it sounds like that's what's offered on that river too. There's, I think, there's just so many opportunities to um, you know pick your passion, uh, and I think there's a place for everything. And you know, um, that's all. I mean, to to each his own. Uh, you know, I'll never. Uh, tell a guy that they're doing it wrong if they're doing it within the you know um you know legal parameters of what you know the fishing game of any you know particular river allows um but uh when what you're doing hinders what other people are trying to do in the same area then that, that's when i think the problem is and, and i think that you know without standing on the soapbox and and sounding like a, an old guy uh for too long um, I think that that's what our next generation of fly anglers needs to understand that go out, do it your way. There's some really cool, you know, like new tactical stuff um, being developed that uh, is, is super fun and, and making the next generation want to do more fly fishing. And we definitely need that. Uh, but when it, when it hinders the way someone else wants to fish, that's when we need to go back to the mindset of fly fishing and the gentleman sport that it is, right? You would never go to a steelhead river and wade in below somebody that's swinging down through a run. You're always going to go in and fish behind him. Uh, so when someone's, you know, up on a super flat, pristine piece of water throwing dry flies downstream, you also don't want to come in below him and, you know, chuck some nymphs in the run and drift through it. And uh, it's just... It's an etiquette thing, I guess. Yeah, but, but beyond that, too, I've, I've been thinking about this recently, um, and, and usually I don't share my ideas too much on this podcast, but I've, I, this, this year I turned 40 and I had a kid, and then I noticed that some of my views on fly fishing have changed, and I was like, oh, man, now I'm, now I'm one of the old guys. But Because <laughs> <laughs> I keep seeing like what the, the kids in their 20s are doing, and I'm like, ugh. Um, but... Part of that, I think, um, I mean, you mentioned a lot of good reasons. Is Part of it, too, is where, you know, everyone knows who Lefty is and, and, and Flip and, you know, and unfortunately, I was about to say Jose, but I, don't, I think a lot of people are, are missing him right now. There's another generation with Chico and stuff, um, and that's just the salt guys, but mostly. But um, there's an era of important people in trout fishing 
um, that I think we're losing touch with. And, you know, we want to, I, th- I think part of the old school is, is recognizing that, you know, with the emergence of a new school that can be, that can get big on Instagram or, um, you know, through, through pro staffs and, and, and whatever, um, there's an era of La Fontaine's and Quigley's and stuff that we don't want to lose, you know, people like them that we don't want to lose touch with. So I think that's part of it too. Absolutely. I think that there's, I think that there is um, an inherent uh, skill involved in certain aspects of our sport that needs to uh, be revived so that it can be explored uh, by the next generation. And we all go through, you know, um, you, you said you, you, you changed your you know, mindset when uh, things in your life change and it changes your perspective. And, you know, the old adage that we all go through uh, a lifespan in angling that is that is the same for everyone. We want to catch a fish. Uh, the next stage is we want to catch a lot of fish. The next stage is we want to catch a big fish. The stage after that is we want to catch a lot of big fish. Right. Uh, and then the final stage, as we go through all these stages in our angling careers, we want to catch a fish. Um, and, and I think for fly fishing, there are certain things about throwing a dry fly to a rising trout uh, in a difficult uh, flat water environment that brings us back to, you know, the, the reason someone, uh, you know, braided together uh, cat gut and silk and right. tried to get that fly out there so many years ago. Um, and, and I think it's something that uh, hopefully will will be explored by all because, you know, I, I do it. I, I do your nymphing. I do uh, trout spay. Uh, I, I indicator fish. Um, I, I did that, you know, for a living for a long time. Um, but I think that all aspects of what we have now, um, there's not just one way to, to if all you ever do is throw on a nymph and rig with a couple of SSG split shot. Uh, I would argue that you haven't seen what fly fishing can be. Yeah, and it's you know it, I'm, I'm very much my I got I got it really into fly fishing when I was young, and then and then when I was in my early twenties, wanted to be famous <laughs> for, for it. And um, you know, I've come to the mindset now that like maybe before I die, I'll get this figured out, right? Right, and. <laughs> Um, I think that's a healthy place to be. And I, I would say that two of the best days I've ever had fishing, I didn't catch any fish. Um, but I, when you were talking about the evolution of an angler there, I was, I, you know, a lot of people apply that to the evolution of a hunter too. And last year I got the big game combo tags in Montana for elk and mule deer. And I was hunting with a buddy and I was like, Hey, just so you know, on that evolution cycle, I need a big trophy. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm immature. I'm immature in, in hunting now, but I was, I was kidding. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, and, 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 and you know, for it, I, I love how you described uh, the fall and and, the, and Hat Creek, and um, it's it's where those experiences can happen. And I and and the way you're describing too, the birth of some of these flies, it's you're tapping into that heritage when you're when you're trying to connect with trout through flies that emerge through these th- through waters like these. That's beautiful. Absolutely. Hat Creek is one where, you know, you can do all that without the boat. So you don't need a special boat. You don't need special access, uh, you know, to get there. It's a super long public stretch. Um, the riffle water that's uh, downstream on Hat Creek is some of the prettiest water in California. Uh, and you you can walk to all of it. And, you know, just like the ranch on the Henry's Fork, um, the carbon flats area and the flat water area of Hat Creek, you kind of sit down in the grass and just watch and observe it's it's more of a hunting environment than it is uh you know flogging the water you know fishing constantly making drifts environment um and it's a it's a cool thing to to go do um and you gotta at least try it i I would say uh, a couple times and then you know if you decide that the fast moving high sticking water is more uh for you then that's awesome um but uh there's something really cool and neat about going to a flat piece of you know spring creek water and trying to you know observe the trout see what they're doing so that you can you know uh, adjust your technique in order to uh make a meet and it's a it's a it's a really cool fun thing that's cool and and what rods are you thinking for these rivers oh i'm throwing four weights up there three and four weights 
Yeah, because I'm throwing mainly drives. Yeah, you know, um, you can throw five. Uh, you know, b- both Hat Creek and especially Fall River uh, can be fished uh, with you know eye lines and uh, little streamer patterns and you know, stripping them along, um, especially in the deeper holes in fall. That's a wonderful way uh, to get them. And you kind of you know work your way down the run elongating your cast each time uh, and kind of sweep the run as if you were, you know, swinging a steelhead run on foot only you're doing it from the boat and just lengthening your line and, and move down and they'll eat that way too. It's kind of fun. Well, Chris, I appreciate the conversation. Um, how can people learn more about uh, what you guys offer and, and what specifically do you all offer at the fly shop with respect to fishing and, and classes and so forth on, on these rivers? Uh, well, I mean, the, the fly shop is a mecca for our sport. And, you know, here locally, uh, we have uh, several uh, classes that we offer, uh, one-day clinics, uh, three-day schools, uh, three-day, you know, uh, space schools that are on location on like the lower Klamath, um, just a wide array of uh, learning opportunities, um, guided fishing uh, year-round uh, for trout and for steelhead. Um you know, not to mention uh, our travel department and, uh, you know, the, the retail aspect of it. But there's a wealth of information uh, on all those uh, things and uh, pricing on uh, the Fly Shop uh, website at theflyshop.com. Um, but, yeah, that's, uh, you know, why we're here in Northern California and why this shop has been here for as many years as it has. Um, and, you know, there's just so many opportunities up here for the fly angler and, you um, we just love sharing our passion um, for it uh, with those getting into the sport or maybe trying a new aspect of the sport. And we've got every array of, you know, guides that specialize in different tactics to, you know, trout clinics and, uh, you know, three-day elongated schools that uh, we offer to help people progress and, and uh, see what this wonderful sport really has to offer. Well, this, this, I learned a lot from this one. I, I already can't wait to get back to California and, and head up there, and so I appreciate the conversation. Come on out. We'll go go chase them. (laughs) Sounds good to me. Uh, Chris, thanks so much. I appreciate it.